I'm Caroline Payson. I'm the Director of Education at the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, and I'm thrilled to welcome you here tonight. Um, this, for those of you who are new to this space, is the Cooper Hewitt Design Center, where we're housing all of our programs until we reopen in the fall of 2014. So we hope you not only continue to attend these programs, but we also have youth programs, family programs, and programs for toddlers. Um, we're also hoping that you get so used to coming here that you come back downtown when we reopen um, in 2014 with 60% more gallery space, better circulation, and a whole new um, visitor experience. So we're getting close um, to those plans too and are super excited. So far we've had almost 13,000 attendees at the programs we've been doing here at the center in the year that we've been open. And we'd like to thank Target for funding the center and funding the majority of the programs that are here. Tonight's talk with John Reddick and architect Jack Travis is the second in Cooper Hewitt's new Harlem Focus series. Um, over the next few months, we'll be um, welcoming designers, architects, artists, and other practitioners who work, whose work engages and involves the Harlem community. The series is curated and led by John Reddick, an architectural consultant and Harlem historian, and they're designed to be a way to highlight the work that's happening here. Um, and in the, we want to talk about design in the widest way possible, whether it's landscape design, architecture, construction, rooftop gardens, um, and urban woodland restoration. And so we hope you join us for the additional talks that will be happening. We have one um, coming up in June as well. Um, we really want to explore the way design impacts and affects this neighborhood um, and are grateful for Target for funding this as well. Um, tonight's event is being live webcast and filmed and will be available on our website at cooperhewitt.org. So if you want to recommend this to some of your friends who weren't able to make it, that would be great. I'd like to take a moment to introduce John. Um, John Reddick is active in architectural preservation and has written on Harlem's architectural and cultural history. He's a graduate of Yale School of Architecture and his love of architecture, African-American culture and history have been conveyed in numerous occasions through tours and the articles he's provided, not only for Cooper Hewitt, but for places like the Studio Museum um, and El Museo de Barrio, the Whitney and the Biography Channel and New York's Historic District Council and other institutions. So please join me in welcoming John, who will talk about our guests. Thank you, Carol. Well, welcome. Uh, I've lived in Harlem since 1980, and we've seen a lot of changes. And one of the things I sort of feel in all the changes that we've seen, that uh, there's been a lot of engagement by people in the neighborhood uh, of various professions that not only influenced the changes in Harlem, but have also influenced sort of global look at urban space and, and the ideas of urban interaction. And so I'm delighted to have with us tonight Jack Travis, who's a contemporary of mine. Maybe he's probably a little younger than me, but well, I'll make him a contemporary <laughs> for, uh, for the moment. But Jack is a architect. He teaches at FIT and Pratt, and he's been a, he was a longtime member of Community Board 10, and looking at a, a professional career that can really engage the community and look at design in ways that not only uh, educates the community, but raises the bar in terms of the community interaction and how that can impact the physical environment. So I was very pleased, when, uh, I love the particular building that we're gonna talk about tonight, the Harlem Hospital. I don't know if you've been up there yet, but it's a, it's a signboard of really this, uh, this historic interaction of uh, African-American artists during the WPA period. And so it brings out, I think of like uh, Tut's tomb when they sort of glimpsed behind the wall and saw great things and made the world kind of see that. And I feel like you've accomplished in your design in many ways that interaction of making something very public that the public hadn't seen for a long time and really forced the issue. It's called the Mural Pavilion, this uh, building in honor of those uh, murals, and it's made a very public statement. So Jack, if you want to come forward, I'm really glad to have Mr. Travis here tonight. <laughs> And I first became aware of Jack when he did a project for the Armani, one of Armani's first stores in New York on, on Fifth Avenue. And I said, who's this young architect? It was a fabulous uh, 
uh, interior. He's gone into some other marvelous interiors. But he really had that, you know, even now you can see he's very dapper. <laughs> and uh, kind of really an aesthetic sense that really bridges the American, African American culture, but also looks at the African influences and, and the past and brings them forward in a very contemporary way. So I'm glad to have this opportunity to kind of talk about some of that uh, tonight. And we have a loop we're going to look at first of, um, of the panels being installed. So we'll run that for you to start. Well, that's what we're looking at now. <clears throat> first of all, I want to say thank you for uh, having me to uh, the Cooper Hewitt Museum and to John and uh, apparently to Target. So, uh, to begin with, what I want to do is um, play a short video, three minutes, and then have a short three-minute loop on myself and my work and then start the presentation. I was graciously invited to this meeting today in order to shed some light on my father's involvement in creating and allowing for the creation of the Merrill Pursuit of Happiness. I've been, I've been made aware of an effort to preserve the mural in its present setting, which currently resides in the corridor of the old nurse's residence. In and of itself, this is a tribute to the artist and the artwork, and is a testament to the caring spirits of all those people endeavoring to keep alive this historical work. However, I will be so bold as to submit a few thoughts regarding some of the difficulties my father encountered in obtaining permission to depict African-American subject matter of any kind and the compromising consequences of doing so. At various times in my life, my dad would recount some of the obstacles he faced in executing pursuit of happiness. In particular, and from the outset, the consensus as seen by one of the hospital administrators was that depiction of black subject matter was not something you saw in artwork of that period and therefore was not to be seen at Harlem Hospital. This position taken by the hospital administrator flew in the face of what art was all about. My dad stated that the man was so arrogant and opinionated regarding this issue, he suggested they meet later to discuss the problem at length. And by the way, would it be okay to bring someone to take notes? The administrator agreed to this. The result of the next recorded meeting was that if the mural pursuit of happiness inclusive of its African-American content should be denied, the notes of that meeting would be released to the New York Times for all to read. Because of the racist overtones inherent in the objections of doing the mural, the administrator yielded to my father's demands. Hence, pursuit of happiness was coerced into being. You can be sure there was some consternation on the part of the administrator who could, and I believe did, have a moderating effect on what should have been a total victory. My father did not fully elaborate on this aspect of the battle for artistic freedom. He did state, however, the location of the mural was inadequate. To clarify what I believe my father's intentions were in fighting for this mural, aside from the African-American subject matter, I will read an excerpt from a paper written by him entitled, The Position of Art in Present-Day Society as I See It. And I quote, We see how the misconception of art and its place in society is influenced in its development. But while many of us might not be able to furnish our homes with antique or period furnishings, we have not decided that furniture is something not intended for us. But in art, we have allowed a lack of chronological knowledge and knowledge of technique in art to grow, then have accepted them to indicate a lack of aesthetic ability to appreciate things so far outside our reach. The fallacy of the idea is illustrated very often by people whose opportunity for visual participation in art has been very limited, as indicated by such statements as, I don't know anything about it, but I know whether I like it or not. This attitude of itself impeded the development of a better understanding of art by its indifference and a lack of facilities for expression and visual participation in art. End of quote. My father, if my father could be here today, I think he would clearly see an opportunity to bring pursuit of happiness out of its present cloistered environment and into the light, into the hearts and minds of the Harlem community, where visual participation would no longer be impeded. Well, that, Mr. Hayes, he lived to be a, like 100. He lived really long. He had a very long life. But he was part of the WPA. Interesting. 
if we kind of look at today and how things are kind of transitioning, during the WPA was a period where the sort of the systems had failed, and in the world of art, they started looking at culture for the everyday man. So if you go in post offices and other buildings of that time period, you'll start to see the mailman delivering mail to all sorts of people and the images and all that. And so for African Americans, it was a chance to show our lifestyle and our history. And when they wanted to do this, they, they met an objection, the group of artists when they wanted to do that. And it was a team of these artists working together. And to fight for that, which is the, the story in the painting, they start in Africa, they look at traditional methods of healing related to Africa, and they move into the 20th century, moving from the south to the north. And all this is conveyed in a series of murals that, at the time, were considered political. There were other murals in the hospital that are show the blacks as surgeons and all that, and that was seen, deemed acceptable. But this departure about looking at black traditions were really being challenged. And so the artists, for them to pull this off, had to really go public. He mentions the New York Times article, which really was significant in allowing them to portray what they saw as their own true history. So. For the 20th century, this was uh, not only just as murals, as murals in a building, this was a kind of breakthrough, because only in Harlem, they have this ability to leverage their, um, their numbers and their history to push this agenda forward. So they're significant in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was on the strength of that sort of fervor that you found in Mr. Hayes that we sort of focused our intent on what the design concept should be for the work of the architecture and the interior design. Uh, I want to play one more video, if I could. My name is Jack Travis, and I was born in Newellton, Louisiana. I practice architecture here in the South Bronx. My main focus has been, over my career, interior design, even though I've trained as an architect. Design is the creative direction that one has or takes uh, that actually connects with one's life purpose. It's the artist and the designer's role to make things happen so that we can see a different world, we can see a different way of approach. Um, as an environmental designer, we start with the plan. Um, often we start with the two-dimensional layout because function is very important. And, and we, we try to understand basic relationships of how people live, but even those become cultural. So how much space does one need? Uh, what is the proximity of space for the parents to the children? Where is the communal space and when does the uh, public private space began from the street, streetscape. All of those things are very, very cultural. So as an African-American architect, I am searching for a definitive aesthetic that not only defines who I am, but also offers the world a different viewpoint of a more positive aspect of living. I would say that my goal is to create an aesthetic or add to an American palette of aesthetics that comes from an African or an Afrocentric or a black base. I always tell people that in environmental design, there is no definitive black aesthetic. Not that it's not there, it's hidden in plain view. We are so connected and we are so transformed as African Americans. Uh, but what is it that binds us as black people worldwide? It's our Africanness. So for me, I go back to the continent, I go back to Kemet, I go back to Egypt, North Africa, and then I go back to Zimbabwe in South Africa. I want to know more about the historical transformations of creation of architecture um, and design from the, the continent. But when I think about blackness and I want to create something, that line becomes something else. It doesn't, it's certainly not straight. And the movement and the motion can change at any one point in time. When I draw lines now, it's about how I feel. It's not about how I think. So I always find that I'm the most creative and I feel the best about my work when I go back to who I am and I try to bring that forward in a positive way. We continue to do theoretical investigations, show our work, and to align with other people that do the same. And we hope that something will emerge from, from what we do. That's, that's the goal. Okay, so that's uh, an introduction basically on the background of the, the, the murals and how they energized and charged us to approach the design concept for the hospital and a little bit about uh, me and who I am. Um, so what I want to do, and, and I wouldn't mind if you had questions, if we had a little banter as we go through the slides so that everybody's not listening to me. <laughs> that's, that's true and that's good, that's good. 
Um, so tonight I want to talk about basically three things. Uh, my work and what drives the energy. I want to talk about the hospital itself and that project, um, which is a, a series of projects under one project head, and then talk about the murals specifically um, and, and end on that note. So the idea of a black aesthetic in the environmental design disciplines is the beginning or point. So I was looking through a magazine a couple of three years ago and I saw this ad for I think Chrysler car or something like that. But I was reading this information and I thought that's exactly how I feel about the kind of approach um, that I'm taking now to environmental design, specifically architecture and interior design. Uh, because it is about a cultural directive. Um, when, I ever, when I look at projects that are slated for this community and for other black communities worldwide, um, it's not so much a, 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 a problem with the fact that there's talent out there that can actually execute projects. There's not a problem with people in the community who have the ability to build projects. Um, and there's certainly not a, pro a problem with programming and, and, and actually having projects done. What I think is the biggest problem is, is a, an identity, a, a directive that tells children that they count, that tells people that there is something about what we do that is embedded in their cultural paradigm for who they are. And I think that that's what's missing most often. And so I focus on that over the last 15 years of my progress um, in, my, in my, my career. Um, so tonight we're gonna talk about three things basically. I'm making a more visible black, keeping it black and making it blacker, and black people six stories high. So let's start with making a more visible black, right? If I were to talk to you about black music or black dance or art, I mean, all of us can get an idea or have some sense in our head that there is such a thing. You know, we can at least discuss it. But when I talk about architecture, there seems to be a ghost in the room, you know. Um, I usually ask people how many can name me two or three black architects. Um, outside of New York City, almost no one can. You know, maybe there's an uncle, maybe somebody knew someone growing up, uh, almost all the time they're male, um, but there's really uh, few people who can name more than one or two black architects, right? So architecture, interior design, interior decorating, interior architecture, landscape architecture and urban planning has been sort of absent in its proliferation of a design um, aesthetic aesthetic that has a black or African base. Right, and so about 10 years ago, I found this um, in a magazine at Pratt Institute. Um, Prattler is a publication on the left side of things. Um, but I thought that this was, again, very telling in the fact that, you know, who says what architecture is and what architecture should be about? Um, and it's been a directive of mine ever since I can actually remember that architecture, again, is for people. Right? And so it's always been that way for me first. It's been less about a formal um, investigation, um, even a spatial investigation um, as a primary directive. It's been about how people use space and how people move through space and um, how people can actually better themselves um, and maintain themselves uh, within the space. Right? And so at the end of this article, it basically talks about a true architecture and what it needs to be um, not only for people who come from my neighborhood, but as a directive for, as we go forward, the population. I think very few people know that in 1960, there were three billion people on this planet, and one billion of those were Chinese. Um, the first time we clocked one billion people on this planet, uh, officially was 1803. Um, and at that time, people thought that there were more people living than had lived entire, um, in the entirety before that in history. Um, but just 130 years later, 1930, there were 2 billion. In 1960, there were 3. We now have 7 billion people. So what happened between 1960 and 19, uh, 2012? Population. Population explodes, <laughs> right. Population and population. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you, if you look, you'll see that in 1977, 1988, 1999, and then in 2011, we increased billion-fold each one of those 10 or 11, 12 years, right? And so now the question is, what does architecture, what is architecture's role in the larger society, right? And it really has to go back and be reflected on, on people. Uh, a large part of that population, that new population, are people of color. And so again, this cultural dynamic along with this earth-centered dynamic, a sustainable green paradigm, really becomes now very important for us to look at. So why a black aesthetic? 
Um, what drives my business um, and, and my, my directive is uh, three basic premises. Uh, children need to see faces that look like their own, right? Working and, and, and existing and creating and, and building their communities. Um, then the question, what if Africans came here as immigrants and not as slaves? And then black architecture does exist, uh, as you'll see, uh, but under so many layers it's hidden in plain view. Just seem to your point about you know young people seeing the black image. When I was growing up, if we saw a black kid in a commercial, like a Rice Krispies, it could be the most mundane commercial. We would run around the house and tell our sisters or brothers, mom, dad, look, my God, there's a black kid in a Chris Rice Krispies ad or whatever. I mean, it really moved us. And, I, and after that, I used to think, if it meant that much to me to see myself, how much did it mean to me all those years that I never saw myself? I can describe the euphoria about the seeing, but I can't des describe the oppression of not seeing myself. So I think that's a, that's a good point that you make in terms of there's images out there, there's images that define our culture, and in, in America that's a melting pot of everybody, how much can we do to make sure that inclusion's there, that everyone feels comfortable? Exactly, and, and I'm, I have Netflix, and we all do, and we all have YouTube, and then you start watching these movies over the last 50 years or so, and you see just how absent we are, or how matter of fact, or how nonchalant. So a lot of these kids in this modern society, and they have all these computers and all of this um, access to imagery, they don't see, first of all, themselves a lot, and they see a lot of negative imagery. And so what happens is things keep perpetuating, and they don't, they don't sort of let up. They sort of, they adjust, but basically the same sorts of things continue. So in the last 15 years, I have evolved uh, what I consider to be 10 principles of a black cultural design directive, right? And if you look at the first four, they really have nothing to do with design, right? Economy, simplicity, ease of construction, and ease of maintenance. Those are four conditions that, that must take place almost in every black community worldwide. There's not one single black community that I can tell you about that is devoid of a sense of, a high sense that economy has to perpetuate anything that happens on a major scale. Um, ease of maintenance is very important because once something it has happened, if it's not maintained again, and if it runs down and people sort of like perpetuate that sort of situation as well. The middle three have to do specifically and directly with the cultural dynamic of blackness, spirituality, heritage, and something that I call duality or irony of the condition, and you might want to talk about that. Um, and it is about being two different people. W.D. Du Bois in The Souls of Black Folks talked about it. Um, a number of other people have also talked about it. But it's this idea of being two people in one to exist in a Western society, which all of us find ourselves being. Um, it's not that all of us aren't multiple people in order to get along. You know, we have a business side, a business head. We have a creative side, a creative head. We have a, a head when we come home to our families, um, as opposed to being out with strangers that we don't know, yes. But for African Americans, what I'm saying is that there is this other way of being that has a cultural connection that has to be either uh, curtailed at best or denied at worst in situations that um, are outside of our community, particularly when they warrant advancement, either financially or politically. Um, and then the last three are, the, are, are, are three of the ten that really have to do with design, right? This idea of earth nurturing. It's a natural situation with the way that Africans and people of African descent build um, in, in, uh, in this, on this planet. A strong indoor-outdoor relationship. Um, we are front space people. You know, I moved to Harlem in 1994, and uh, one Sunday I was walking down to the street, and I heard a policeman on a bullhorn say this and I swear to God, it's true. He said, okay, all the cars that are triple parked, you must move, right? <laughs> triple parked because there's no way to stop double parking. And, and why in, in this community, and why is double parking so, so, so important? And why do people cross 125th Street like it's urgent through the traffic and then get on the other side and have no place to go? Right? And you see these things constantly, or you see where the basketball court is in a projects, and when it's next to the streetscape, those kids claim that space. The, the young males claim that space, and nobody elderly, nobody with any children or anything is going to get any kind of connection into it. It's because of that streetscape. So as people are passing by, whether they're walking or driving, and people are doing activity, there's a natural connection 
for us to that streetscape. So when you're planning a situation for residential, you have to plan first for the elderly, then you have to plan for the children, and then you have to give basically the rest of it to the, to the younger males, but you have to understand the relationship of what drives that energy in those kids. And then finally, this intense use of color, texture, and pattern. I was at a AIA convention in 2000 in Philadelphia, and Ricardo Legoretta, a Mexican architect, won the um, gold medal, which is the highest design um, award that one could win from the AIA. And as he's showing his work, and he's Mexican, as he's showing his work, all of these buildings with color are coming up, like purples and pinks and, and reds. And, and there's an audience of about 22,000 architects, mostly white male. And there's a, sort of this like subtle hush over the room. And then he realizes and he says, in a pause, he says, you know, we Mexicans, we are irresponsible with color. And the whole room broke up, you know? And I thought, I gotta go talk to him because I can tell him that Africans, we're more irresponsible with color. Color, pattern, and texture in an intense overtone is something that is vibrant. Um, one day, um, I was driving down uh, Lenox Avenue, and if you can't hear me, raise your hand because I'm terrible with these things. I was driving down Lenox Avenue, um, and I saw the Schomburg in the distance. And at the time, there was an Indabelli show, um, this, this tribal group in South Africa that the women paint these houses, these beautiful, rich colors, almost like in a geometric abstract pattern, and then with a lot of literal interpretations thrown into them. But someone had draped on the front of that stairwell uh, an Indabelli pattern, and I could see it from about 10 blocks away driving up. And I thought, you know, that's what Harlem needs to look like. Harlem needs to look like that, and if Harlem looked like that, our children, maybe they wouldn't be wearing their pants halfway off their asses up and down the street. It's, it's this visual dynamic that constantly says, you know, that's our most powerful sense. It says who you are, what you're about, and whether or not you count. And that's the way these kids take it. There are other factors, yes, but the visual dynamic is very, very important. So here are the 10 principles that sort of drive the force. And in environmental design, there are basically six areas of interpretation, right? There's artwork, embellishment, applied motif, ornament, form, and space. It's usually those first four that as African-Americans, we can manipulate uh, the power of the last two um, economically, uh, politically, et cetera, become huge and almost outside of the realm of what most African Americans can actually, and, and Africans worldwide can actually, without great assistance, uh, get our hands and heads around. Um, so um, I was watching Mo Better Blues the other night, Spike Lee's uh, third movie, fourth movie. And if you look just at the cinematography of that movie by Wynn Thomas, the set designer, um, and Ernest Dickerson, who is the uh, cinematographer, there is a black aesthetic in that movie that, in my opinion, Spike Lee was never, ever able to reach in any of the others. But if you look at how that movie was shot and the, 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 the wardrobes, et cetera, uh, the costumes, just an incredible black aesthetic with this background of the brownstones, the neighborhood, and a very, what I call, um, a Eurocentric sort of setting. But in that Eurocentric setting, um, we are able to make an Afrocentric, meaningful place and space, and that's what those first four are doing. So my thrust is that we look at form, we look at space, and we take it to that next level. So in the past, I've had uh, opportunities to work with a number of people, starting with Giorgio Armani, who gave me my first job and started my office. Um, and Spike Lee came after that because I had worked for Giorgio Armani. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's all connected, <laughs> right? Um, and we did Spike Lee's first brownstone in um, Brooklyn. Uh, we did five of Wesley Snipes' eight houses. And as we know, he has a ninth house, but we didn't, we didn't do that. <laughs> um, but we did five projects for him, and this was the very first one. This was the L.A. residence when he was making four movies a year. Uh, it was a great, great time, and he allowed us a lot of leeway to actually try to look at, again, this idea of an aesthetic. We also worked on John Saunders' house in uh, Hastings-on-Hudson. John is a, a sports commentator for ABC News and for ESPN. Right. And we've done a number of um, interior projects in Harlem and, and in New York City in general, all the way to Brooklyn and um, Staten Island, as well as uh, Queens. Um, this is one that's on 110th Street, um, 100 St. Nicholas, and uh, it's a... 
And this way, I see like there, there really is form in here. We can see the curved wall and some of the aesthetic you talk about. Now we don't see as much color. This, what was the client's right. feeling on? Well, the idea here was to explore form and to make a hut, to make this one centered place from his living area, a place of gathering in his um, dining area. So the dining area was where he said that he he liked to meet and greet his friends, and they sit around and they talk. His assistant pastor for my wife's church at the time, Dundee Holt. Uh, and that was the idea. So you're in the foreground in the living room, and then you walk down this corridor, I think to your left, uh, to the bedroom areas. But it was this centered space that had the spiritual energy uh, that he was actually looking for, right? Uh, this is my daughter's room. She's here tonight. And she gets tired of this, but uh, let's bring it up. And so the idea was a child's place, you know, for an African-American female child. Um, what kind of place should actually be done um, um, for her uh, sensibility. Her bed is built into the floor, the floor is raised, right? Um, and then a number of these cultural, visual, um, Afrocentric icons are thrown throughout. But we wanted again to look at space and we wanted to add color by, again, embellishment. Well, we'll get the client's opinion during the question and answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then lately, we've been doing what, a series of what I call paper architecture studies on uh, a black cultural aesthetic. And the first one starts with this idea of um, looking at an icon building Philip Johnson's glass house in New Canaan, uh, built in 1947 by the uh, owner, Philip Johnson, uh, iconic architect. Uh, Johnson has a real connection to Harlem. Uh, Philip Johnson was gay, and James Baldwin was gay. And James and Philip Johnson's first great love was a black uh, entertainer named Jimmy Daniels. And later in his life, he says that was his greatest love, but he didn't have the nerve in those days to follow through on it. And Jimmy Daniels went on to have it. So it's interesting to see the two in that sort of a closeted life with a very open house. Exactly. He had a whole other house on that site that wasn't as open as the, the glass house. Well, exactly. I mean, you just, you just brought it up. The idea was to take... <laughs> The idea was to take um, a, a gay black celebrity. Oh, interesting. I didn't yeah. even talk. Same program. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's, that's good. Same program, same site, and um, do a visual dynamic of what it might look like. And this is my interpretation of Glass House from an Afrocentric aesthetic. Right? And then this one you saw in the video, uh, this is a, an attempt at a suburban retreat. And then this one you also saw is a passive solar uh, house, again, integrating earth um, and sustainable green ideas with cultural dynamics. The house is built halfway into the earth, so all of the um, soil that was taken out to excavate is actually then put on the top of the house, so the house is almost totally submerged um, in the soil. Right, And this is for Phoenix, Arizona, where I went to undergraduate school. And this whole, again, directive goes all the way down to uh, the details, the materials, um, looking at furnishings, which we call small-scale studies in architecture, um, um, all the way through. Um, and then just before we get to the hospital, um, this is a project that you all know of. On 116th Street, I work with Fred Schwartz, architects on the Kalahari, same kind of directive that you see in the hospital, right? So, um, Working on Harlem Hospital. Yes. No. That was um, I want to say Howard Stern. It's Robert <laughs> Robert <laughs> Robert A M Stern. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily. I mean, he talks about the, you know when he talked about that design, he talks about sort of African influence in terms of the, the grid and all that. But if you look at it from a distance, it, it was much more much stronger in his talking about it and the drawings than it ever comes through in terms of the architecture when you physically see it. So if you look at it, there's this kind of shadow pattern, but it doesn't have that kind of three-dimensionality that uh, he's talking about in terms of you really read it out from the, from the building. Well, it's interesting, though, on the, that project on 110th Street, I think it was three iterations before they actually selected an architect that actually built it, mm -hmm. right? During the second iteration, Bernard Schumi, who was then the um, dean at the School of Architecture at Columbia, came into my office and interviewed me to be on his team for the project. And he also interviewed Yolanda Daniels, who was a professor 
at um, Columbia and one other person, I think, and he chose Yolanda. And Yolanda and he did a series of some uh, very striking images for that building. One of them was of a djembe drum, which is actually on the, the internet, uh, which was incredibly three-dimensional and very provocative. Um, but then I think they dropped those um, um, contestants and then they went for a third iteration and Robert A.M. Stern won. Now Robert A.M. Stern won, part of the reasons I think is because about two years before he had given a symposium at Yale, he's the dean at Yale and, and currently still is, and um, a, a black female student there, um, she uh, moderated this uh, um, symposium on black culture and design. And he was there all three days for that presentation and uh, apparently gained a lot of information and thought that he gained enough that he could actually do this without hiring me or anybody else. He didn't hire Yolanda or Jennifer Newsom was the student's name at Yale at the time, as far as I know. Yeah, you went to that, yeah, yeah, and he was there. I have to admit, I, I saw him every day um, and he was very focused. Um, and so then, you know, I, I hear that he's doing this project. Um, but the Kalahari is the, the, and the, the um, Harlem Hospital are the two that we're uh, involved in in the community, the two large projects, right? And then on the, on the side here, the left side, you see the, the design team and our clients down at the bottom. Uh, the design team was very large, huge team, a um, lot of meetings, a lot of discussions, uh, very fluid uh, team, uh, no major hiccups, and uh, at the end, we're all still friends, and that's always good. <laughs> right. Um, so the first iteration was, you know, in our proposal when we won the project was to have these murals go across the entire lot, the two, um, the two uh, blocks. And um, we've, we found out that we had enough money to do the new patient pavilion, but it would cost about $40 million alone just to bring it to 135th Street going south. So that's still um, a vision of the hospital, but that's on hold right now. And here you see another perspective of it. Well, one of the things, if we could just go back really quick, you know, they're, they're talking about, you know, make it large. I mean, as soon as I saw this, I kind of thought, like, even if this technology had come about in terms of how to do this in terms of window detailing, I thought that was a very black project in the kind of sense that it was in your face in terms of something that really you couldn't get access to before. It was as I would take tours to see the murals. These murals were on two sides of a very narrow corridor in the old nurses' uh, pavilion. And even though it was open to the public, if you took people there and they heard me talking in that hallway to a group of people, they would come out and make us leave. They were really strict about it. So I felt like it was almost a secret that now was really much this billboard. I really felt that that was an aesthetic uh, that you wouldn't see this use in other places. So you, oh, so you felt that. Oh, yes, absolutely. It's it, that intensity that we, we talked about um, earlier. Absolutely. And so just quickly, um, going through the project itself from the architect's uh, viewpoint, um, HOK, where the architects, Richard Cerave is a good friend of mine. He was the project manager, excellent job. Uh, Ken Drucker was the designer. Um, Ken was a little bit hesitant of the black thing. You know, he's, he's a modernist, strict modernist, very good designer. Um, and all he wanted to do was talk about design and skin and glass and metal. And for him, it was about glass and metal and well, its purity. When, when we talk about skin, blackness comes up. <laughs> well, not for him. <laughs> yes, for us it did. And I try to, I try to explain to him there's 147 shades, somebody said, of black <laughs> skin. You know, he didn't care. There was silver. There was silver polished, silver brushed. <laughs> and maybe in a pinch, there was maybe, you know, bronze. Uh, but that was basically it for him. But then he sort of mellowed through the process um, as we all sort of talked. But here you see um, the bulk of the new building. Um, and this, again, is one of those drawings that you have to do for the building department and, um, you know, for clients to get an idea of square footage and zoning to make sure that your building, you know, meets all the requirements. And you can see that the top is stepped back, another requirement of zoning. You can go six stories on the, on the street, then you've got to make a step back so that you get natural light. Um, sunlight down to the streets. And believe me, uh, I was working with Bill Perkins's office at the time when they were, you know, looking at this. And politically, there was a lot of push to have this visibility in terms of the art. I think on the hospital side, they were getting a lot of pressure from the elected officials. And so, for a lot of the public art projects you see in Harlem, the, the level, particularly the ones I've been engaged in, they never would have come to fruition at that level without this real political 
push. And so the, the, the test in this back and forth is to try to bring quality talent to bear and political muscle to bear to sort of have the physical show up in the end. Because we have these studies all the, all the time, but to get them to fruition, there really needs to be this kind of political muscle behind it. Well, you're absolutely right, John, because what we find is if the client is not on our side, we just don't get picked. Uh, for instance, we know that HUD's doing a new building, the uh, uh, NBA basketball players did a new building, and they, nobody ever called us, or anybody like us. It doesn't have to be me, necessarily. Um, so you're right, it, it definitely comes from that push. But, but the yellow shows our site and um, the whole connection between this building here, which is Ron Brown, which is an existing structure, which is a very difficult connection, and the tower that's to the south, right on the corner of 135th Street and Lenox. Right? And so here's a plan of the campus. Um, the emergency entrance is back here for all the vehicles, et cetera, and for emergency drop-off. And then over on the north side, there is another emergency entrance right off the street. And then the main entrance, as we all know, is on Lenox, which is on the west side, or Malcolm X Boulevard, or 6th Avenue, whichever your preference. Um, and then there's a, an atrium between the two, which I'll talk about. Our new building, the new patient pavilion here, and the existing tower. Um, so here's another uh, view uh, specifically of our building itself sitting um, in between the Ron Brown building and the uh, tower building. And uh, you see here is the atrium down below, which uh, gives the city and the community this wonderful public space, like a public living room. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the interior finishes on that later. I forgot how many connections there are. Let me just go back one. Um, and so again, quickly, you can see again, the level of in, in, increase just for the construction of the building. Um, the, the construction of the building, the urban siting, the interior design, the landscaping, those are four distinct um, different project directives, but they're all integrated. And as uh, the first um, iteration, of course, is the urban plan, but after that comes the architectural presence. All of the programming into the building, which was a heavy, heavy programmed building, um, and then the materiality of what should actually happen in the scan, and then lighting studies, uh, material studies, all the way through structural studies, as you can see here, all part and parcel of the process. Landscape architecture, uh, uh, Elizabeth Kennedy, who's a black female landscape architect extraordinaire. She is a, a, a Harvard graduate, and I believe she's going to do a talk yeah, right, yeah. Um, in the in the summer here as well. Uh, but she was on board. And again, this whole notion of, again, an African garden, or what can we do to make a sense of outdoor space connect to a sense of Afrocentric indoor space? And she was, again, very, very open to that. But again, wanted to do it in her own way. Um, and I think she was, again, very successful with a lot of the, her proposals. Problem is budget, right? So a lot of the things that she has um, envisioned and had approved for the project are not in place as of yet, but they're on board and they will go ahead. And it was a very elaborate study of um, trees uh, for the outside on Malcolm X Boulevard, uh, trees running through the atrium, up the steps going east through the building, and then out the back of the building at the emergency exit. Um, this was actually going to be a green campus. Um, she even found a linkage and uh, protection components that had, again, a sense of a pattern from an African print that we had uh, been looking at. Um, and then we looked at the, the kinds of plantings and things like that that we could actually incorporate that had more of an African or black cultural connection. Um, and so again, briefly, the idea of these murals inside the uh, project quickly became the focus, right? And so if we could actually hone in on what these artists of the WPA period did, um, and drive a design concept directly from that for the entire building, uh, we thought that that would be apropos. Uh, almost everybody that I spoke to in the very beginning of this project were uh, you know, heads on with what these murals were about, what they needed to be, and how could we actually get them to a point where more people could actually see them. So we thought this is a perfect beginning, right? Um, Virtus Hayes' um, Pursuit of Happiness, um, which reminded me of something that I'd seen before in Washington, D.C. by Hilliard Robinson on the facade of um, the Langston Terrace housing project uh, that I visited, I think, uh, about six years before this project, um, which was called Up From Slavery. And I thought, we should probably be doing the same thing. We should be looking at 
um, the diaspora, how we come from a place to make new places, how we come from a history to make new histories, because that's what we have to do. Um, there's so much that most of us don't know about our history. And so if we could actually do that in the design, uh, we thought that that would be a good thing. So we identified three places in, on the continent where the majority of slaves, we were told, came out of, right? So it's Angola in the south. In the middle, it's the Ghana Gold Coast, as all of you know. And then in the north, uh, still sub-Saharan, is um, the um, island of Goree, Senegal. And so these three destinations, we connected with 15 destinations in the uh, South America, Central America, uh, North America, and the islands. And so we tried to tell a story on that migration, right? Part of the big story was going to be told in the atrium between the two uh, buildings. Um, and so we had a vision of a heritage wall, is what we called it. And on that heritage wall was going to be a scarification of material to talk about the difficulty of progress, um, but the actual making of progress as well. And in the floor plates themselves, we were going to choose 15 plaques, three on the upper side of the east part of the atrium, which is what we call the, the motherland. And then the steps we saw as the middle passage. And then once you got down going west, you came into this flat area. And those were the 15 destinations, the point of call for each of the new histories. Well, one of the things, I, I've been in this atrium space. I'm really, it's really striking the pattern of materials that you draw from fabric. And could talk about that a little bit. Um, yes. And first, I want to give a um, note to Bernadette Berry. She's here. Can you raise your hand, please? Mm -hmm. Bernadette Berry worked for me, and then she worked for HOK through the rest of the project. And the lion's share of what you see in terms of colors, patterns, textures, were all selected by this young lady. Um, she did an incredible job. And when we charged her to go to look at Brazil, Barbados, um, the South in, 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 in America, the Gullah Islands, these are the places we looked at, uh, Haiti, Jamaica, et cetera, she did an most incredible <coughs> investigation and brought um, probably about 10 times as much stuff as we actually decided on. So she really did an incredible job. And I still feel like this, there's this kind of African and Western dialogue. You know, there's this kind of modernist aesthetic in terms of frames the building, but there's this other level, a very sophisticated interpretation in terms of materials and color and pattern. Well, for me, you know, I, I, I went to Arizona State University undergraduate, then I went to University of Illinois graduate, and um, everybody knows that almost all these architecture schools are strict modernist sort of factories. You know, this is, this is what you're going to learn. Then I worked for SOM, right, and I have a colleague here who worked with me at SOM, and she knows that's what we did. It was a really strict modernist, formalist, um, theoretical approach to design. Um, where materials were, you know, seen as honest and simple, and again, very sophisticated. And like so, jazz. Like, like jazz music, <laughs> so exactly. We're, we're, we can do that. Exactly. <laughs> and so, so for me, it was to go back to a beginning of something that was the opposite of that, in a way that was sort of found, that had a patina, that wasn't perfect, that had a, uh, a, a slight tinge to it that was still wonderful. You know, that it all didn't have to be sophisticated to a certain level, with a certain mindset, clean, et cetera. That there was another kind of sophistication. And that I could marry the two based on who I was. And to me, that was the, the point of departure. Well, in music, and a lot of um, European uh, composers that were modernist composers, they loved jazz because it had this room for improvisation. Exactly. And that no, like where we might go back and look at Mahler or Schubert and say it has to be played, we judge it being played exactly the same over and over again, when jazz always allowed for this change, that there was a structure, within that structure there could be variation and a chance to show off someone else's talent. It wasn't like a rivalry, it was a chance to sort of infuse the music with some, something that was unexpected. Exactly. And, and for me, it, it, it starts out, when you talk about music, it starts out with the blues. The blues to me is the root of jazz. And in the blues, not only do you have, one, people learning to play themselves, for themselves, by themselves. People with raw voices learning to sing for themselves and for people who look like them. And then people who connect on a circuit that many call the Chitlin circuit. Um, and they found places to play to actually connect to those people. To me, that's where architecture still is for us. 
it's, it's still at the state of the blues. And while I love jazz, and jazz has this great technique level to it, it really is about us singing the blues. And th I think the minute that we understand that, we'll sing the blues and we'll make the blues great. And the blues, when it's great, becomes jazz. Um, I can't jump to jazz <laughs> because I see so much blues in architecture, right? But what within the blues, uh, you know, I'm, I'm seeing Sun House and I'm seeing Muddy Waters and I'm seeing what it can actually become. And that's what's exciting for me. I like the fact that it is tarnished. I like the fact that it is unsavory as well as savory. And I like the move to that level of sophistication because to me, that's the journey. The journey is what's important to me. Well, Karen, and I have a friend that we talk about Harlem changing. We said, well, we want the funkiness to stay. We want a little bit of the, you know, you'll see some of these storefront churches and some of these buildings that really have a certain kind of energy of a period that really is like an individual trying to come and make their self visible in another way. I think that you want a little bit of that mix to kind of stay in the community. Exactly. And that's why when I go to Chelsea Market, for instance, I, I just love it. I mean, I just sit there and I watch how old connects to new, how you know, uh, surfaces that really could have been finished weren't, and how new surfaces come in and just make their own statement. And then you can look up in Chelsea Market and you can see stuff that they totally forgot about, that it is still, nobody cleaned off the, the paint to even make it look better, it's just there. And so when you go through that place and you look at the details, you see that it is really quite a special place. And I find the same thing when I go to West Africa and I walk through the villages. There's just something going on. And you know what, what I find in the villages? No trash. Zero. No trash. And so when I'm looking and I'm thinking, why do people think that this place is unsophisticated? Why do they think that it's rough? Why do they, because we're used to a certain sophisticated way. But our certain sophisticated way has this downside too, and we're not oftentimes looking at the downside that it has, right? But um, the well, villages so, are really refreshing. Well, I mean, I just think of my growing up with my grandparents, nothing went to waste. We're in a culture where we discard everything, but if you look at the African-American quilt, you look at the range of pig that we cooked for, a, for good or bad, that nothing was discarded. There was a value in everything. And I think in 20th century culture, there's a stepping away from that. I think in certain ways when we're looking at food and stuff, we're going back to that. But I think in our culture, you know, nothing was discarded, so everything had a value. So if you go into some of these villages, you know, the, the bottles are, you know, the plastic bottles are used for something. Nothing is kind of just said that we can't use this. There's a way of kind of making it all work. Right. And now they're building mud huts with plastic bags and plastic bottles in the actual construction of these houses. And these houses look interesting. They're not just basic round hut forms. Um, so I like that, and I like the whole transition of that. Um, and then here's a, a, a plan of the, the floor again that you can see these plaques that were going to be embedded into the floor plates. Again, all the materials picked by Bernadette, um, approved by HOK. And then you see those angled lines. Those lines are, are directed towards true east, which is the direction of the motherland, Africa. So a, a parent could come in with their child and they can say, that's the direction of the motherland. And that's what we did. We went back and we looked at some of the, um, the way houses were embellished, painted um, with these applied motifs and what these motifs uh, were about, the meaning behind them, et cetera. And a lot of them were very abstract. And then all of a sudden, you know, you'd see like a chicken or an airplane. And I was, remember being there once with Peter Malafani, a South African architect friend of mine who's since passed away. And I went to this woman who was painting and found out she was the daughter of the wife because the wife, the first wife, gets to paint the black lines and to set up the motif. <laughs> and then the second wife, third wife, or the daughters fill in. And those women are able to pick their colors uh, with the first wife. But one woman was painting and she painted a chicken and this beautiful mosaic, you know. And I'm, again, black, but I'm Western. And I said, oh my gosh, she messed that up. And, and so I went to her and I said, why did you do that? Why did you put the chicken in? And she said, because it came by. <laughs> and I thought, I love that. That freed me, you know? And the same thing, I saw an airplane, I went, it must have flown by. Oh, come on in. Don't you can walk around the projector, so you won't Don't stay there. The, you want to affect the projection. Oh, they can, can see, in. they're fine, they're fine. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's us, that's what we do. We make space. Um, 
And so we, we not only looked again at um, physical structures, but we also looked at patterns like most people do. And we wanted to figure out how we could actually abstract those patterns. Um, but we had people come in to tell us about the meanings. We didn't want to, to get away from the meaning. Um, and in some of these things, you can actually do that. Right, so uh, we needed to have an idea. So we looked at Kuba mud and kente, which are the three natural African claws. Everything else is not, which I did not know at all. So all these patterns that you see, even in these African markets, are not African, which is amazing to me. They're actually Malaysian. Yes, and they actually are made by people in Malaysia for the most part, but you know, Indonesia and places like that. And then there was a Dutch company in the 1800s that was uh, transporting these things. Um, you know, very lucrative business and, and does so today with a number of other companies. And what they do is they take the, 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 the fabrics to Africa, sell them to the Africans so the Africans can sell them to the world. Go figure, <laughs> right? But, but mud, Cuba, and kente is important. We have 10 more, we gotta get through this, right? And so then we wanted to connect with the, um, the African-American aesthetic. And so well, we did, we looked at blues and jazz and the colors that certain artists put in their paintings. Well, the Bearden, if you ever see the movie Gloria, there's a movie with Jenna Rollins called Gloria, and Bearden did the film credits in the very beginning. The, the, and this is one of those drawings he did for that, uh -huh. that movie, believe it or not. Right. <laughs> All right, so let me just go through real quick to show you. And so the fusion here in the slide began. Right, so here's another shot again of, of several plates showing the interiors. Um, we did de de uh, designs in detail for the elevator cabs, um, all the flooring, the walls, every place throughout the entire building. Bernadette was basically in charge of almost all aspects of um, getting the interiors uh, done, all of the materials and finishes, and all these boards are hers as well, of which there were several for virtually one for every major space in the hospital project, even the children's uh, space, um, as well as the patient rooms, right? So a little bit about the murals, I'm gonna go very quickly, and the project team, I should go back to this because again, here's a whole nother project team, uh, again, for the murals, uh, separate from the campus and the design of the building, right? Um, uh, we had a gla glass fabricator, of course, uh, a mural a preservationist, uh, and then a mural art consultant on this team. All right, and um, um, forgive me, you won't be able to read these. Um, I had a lot of text in here, just to let you know about the artist, but you, you heard uh, Mr. Hayes' son. Hopefully that'll suffice a little bit. Um, but there were four artists who were selected. Um, there were seven actually selected. Four we're restoring. And Charles Austin was probably one of the, if not the most important, one of the most important ones with, with Mr. Hayes. But Austin was in charge of all the four um, actually in charge of the seven, and with that seven, 35 other artists helped them to create these murals. Um, but he was the one that was, uh, had the organizational skills, and he actually did two of the murals. Um, one, um, Magic and Medicine, and then Modern Medicine. Um, both of those have um, very, very strong tales to tell, but you can go on the site from the Harlem Hospital or from Columbia University. All you have to do is type in Harlem Hospital murals and all of this information will come up. Um, Alfred Crimmy was the only white um, artist who was selected. Um, he had the most credentials coming in. He was older. Um, he's from Sicily, his Italian background. Not sure how he was with the racial aspects and tones, but uh, did not finish. He only did one of, I think, four murals that he was uh, frescoes, rather, that he was um, commissioned to do because he had so much other work, and so he left the project. Um, never got a story on that. Well, it's really interesting in the gloves that they have on white uniforms, but their hands are black, even though they're wearing gloves. It's a, you yeah. know, so it's so trying to tell That's something in that. And then this was the only mural that had all white people in it, <laughs> as well, by the white artists. Very interesting time. Um, and then Georgette C. Seabrook, who was just a um, wonderful person, amazing artist. Um, the last one alive, she just died uh, last, a year ago, December in 2011. Um, she did a wonderful piece, the only woman, again, working on the project in the seven. And of course, Mr. Hayes, who was the most um, prolific, um, the most vocal, uh, outspoken, and the most radical uh, militant <laughs> artist of the bunch. Um, and with he and Austin, they actually got this done without their um, militant fervor, uh, their behind the scenes politicking, they wouldn't have gotten, none of these artists would have worked, right? And so uh, you heard about the controversy uh, very, very quickly. Um, 
there were four things that were said in this letter. You know, the one that really struck me was that Negroes would be offended by seeing Negroes. Um, I thought that that was just absolutely crazy, but that was, again, the time. And um, the controversy was um, suppressed, as you all know, and the murals were done. Um, we chose a lot of the colors for the glass on the building from the murals themselves. So what we did was we went through a process of extracting color ways from each of the murals and then trying to line those up to make some sort of rhythm, like jazz music, um, and to come up with color schemes. Right? Ultimately, um, you're going to see how we laid up the panels, but this was the original plan layout um, for the Virtus Hayes uh, Gallery, which was, again, the most prolific. Four sides painted and a small uh, gallery uh, uh, a hallway to the offices. Uh, down below, I should also mention that uh, Mr. Alston's two pieces uh, were set across from one another in a diptych um, arrangement. Um, then in Ms. Seabrook's piece on the top and Mr. Crimmy's piece on the bottom, they had individual places on different floors, right? So the hospital had this incredible um, criteria that had to be met in order to, to get these panels um, out of where they were and into a gallery. Um, so we did a lot of different uh, reiterations on how this gallery should work. Um, my thought was that it should be along the streetscape so people could walk by, not even come into the hospital, but to be able to see them. Um, HOK agreed. We tried to work that out. It's very, very difficult. Here's one option that you see here down below. Uh, this was the gallery, uh, which we thought was the most um, adv advantageous. Then I thought the angle was a little weird, so we straightened it up. We thought we could do that, but we had too much program. Um, and then these were some presentations to really try to push that to get some of the program out of the hospital in order to do the gallery right, but the gallery lost. And ultimately, I love what, what was the, um, the compromise, and that's this series of galleries here. That's this one here, where Virtus Hayes is. This one is where the, the two Austin pieces are. Um, and then back here, looking south, is where Mr. Crimmy's piece is. Uh, Miss Seabrook is going to have her own location in the actual atrium area, which I thought, since she passed away, they actually changed that location, and I thought that that was actually great. So if you go over to the hospital now, you can walk into the atrium and you can see them working on her piece, right? Black people, six stories high, right? This is the last of the three. So the idea, again, was to bring that art forward so that people can see it without coming into the hospital because so many generations had been uh, around Harlem had never known the art was even there. So while we were talking about winning this competition, I just said, let's put black people six stories high. And of course, I was looked at like, what the hell is he talking about? Because the process that was actually done was not even invented. The, the, the actual process of getting these murals to read the way that they read at this level, at this scale, was actually done on this project. This project has also already won three awards uh, specifically for the glass paneling. Um, there are three different pieces of glass. And in one piece, the actual fritted information is placed on the glass and then burned itself into the glass. So it becomes part of the building. Right? And then you have to have a sandwich so that you have a, a good um, uh, insulation barrier between outside and inside. Right? And then you have to be able to let light come through these spaces. People have to be able to see out at night, but then people have to see the imagery on the outside. It can't be too, too diluted so that people can't see it. Right? And so David Balick um, just did an incredible job. And he stayed with us. I'm sure he lost a lot of money on this project. <laughs> but he stayed with us in order to do it. And uh, there are 429 panels here, all precisionally placed and done. Um, you saw in the, um, the presentation earlier when you first came in, um, all the laying up in the uh, factory and all of the iterations that we went through. And as the designers, we did models and drawings <coughs> and studies in order to, one, make the cavity uh, such that it was insulative, and then two, to actually make sure that the, the paint um, the image on the glass worked um, from both sides, inside and out. And then finally, to make sure again that uh, all of this can actually be done and laid up um, construction wise. We needed so much private funding you can't even imagine. For instance, we had a, a $2 million electrical problem starting out. 
You know, there was a vault that Con Ed was not willing to build for us, you know, because they said, you know, if you want to do what you want to do, you're going to have to build your own vault because we think that we have enough power for the hospital from our vaults, but we can't take additional because of your program. So we had to find the $2 million to do that. And it, the, the project was that way all the way through. So yes, the artwork is about 10 million, was it about 4 million? 4 million or $6 million now, and all that money was donated, right? And so here you just see some reiterations almost done, uh, iterations of how we had to look at the pixels and how we were actually going to get the paint on the glass um, so that close up um, you can actually work it out, but then far away you can actually see an image without distortion. And since you're going to be looking at this thing from across the street, cars driving on the street and people walking along the streetscape, as well as people on the inside looking back, and if you go into the gallery, you'll notice on the second level on the east wall, you can actually view back down onto the galleries from an upper area, a reception area. So there were you know, three different ways and four or five different depths that we had to consider in doing this glass, and we just basically crossed our fingers. Um, and uh, we did a lot of um, mock-ups, and we did a couple of um, full-scale mock-ups. And here is a model that was actually done um, with light in order to see how the panels would actually work. And the ultimate view is the view from the streetscape, right? And what that's going to do to you at dusk and what that's going to do as you get into the evening. But in the daytime, people have to be able to look out from inside the hospital. And so there you have it. This is an actual photograph. It's not a rendering. Yeah, this is, a, this is David Warkall. He's an incredible photographer. You know, he did my daughter's room, too, as a, as a, as a, a favor. I cannot afford this guy. Um, so again, I want to end with this whole directive of a black cultural directive because for me, it's, it's, it's about intensity, right? We have to do more because we need this. And as I said, you know, the more people know that they count, the less chance of them wearing their pants hanging off their butts around town. That's a parental. <laughs> that's, it, I think that's bigger than parental. Um, <clears throat> and so I want to end with two quotes. The first one is by Derek Bell, and it's like... Um, Basically, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> the, the, the problem is so deep, and we talk about it, it's surface, some of us really care, some of us get emotional, but it's it, it really in the intensity of the doing that is important. My whole directive in my career is to bring about more of a black aesthetic in environmental design, and that is the laser focus, and that's the way that I think that we have to be. Um, finally, Gore Vidal in 1960 said this, you know, um, this is the state of his thinking about the world, and I t totally agree with this, you know, that we are all in a prison of sorts. And by that, he means that we're bound up and wound up by so many of the things that we think are correct or the things that we would like to think that are correct um, for our own well-being, etc. But there's a role to play for the artist and the designer, and I had designer here, he didn't, in 1960, right? And art is that, that look out so that you understand the prison and you can actually then um, navigate yourself within it, right? But it's that look out. So uh, tonight, it's my hope that I've given you a look out. Thank you. So we have any questions while we're... Yes, Karen. And we hit a little air. Uh, I just wanted you to talk about, um, and, in a, and I'm sorry if I missed it at first, but the, your building really connects two buildings at Harlem Hospital that are named for uh, to Martin Luther King Pavilion as well as Ron Brown. And they both had some connection to Harlem and just in their story and why they're named that. I, didn't, I thought that might be as much well, as Well, Martin Luther King, he was, he was stabbed. I don't know if people know this, but there was an incident where he came to sign a, a, a book signing at um, Bloomstein's department store. And his life was saved in the 1950s at Harlem Hospital. He was taken from there to Harlem Hospital. And uh, so I think he has a, a life-changing. And he gave a great speech. A little girl wrote him a letter because he said the, the, 
the, the lower opener was so close to his, the main artery that if he had sneezed, he would have died. And he, made a, he gave a speech about that based on this little girl, so I'm so glad you didn't sneeze, or whatever. And he talks about how close to death he came. So really, Highland Hospital was significant in saving his life in the 1950s. And then Ron Brown, his father, had been the um, hotel manager for the Hotel Teresa. So Ron Brown had literally grew up in that hotel. And at that hotel, Charlie Rangel worked as like a bellboy or whatever. So it had been, that had been a significant place in Ron Brown's uh, life. So I think that's what kind of drew the, those references to the hospital. Right, and, and our building is the mural pavilion. So it is um, now an homage to the artists, the four artists, the seven artists, who actually created these murals, which was the first uh, time that African-American artists worked on African-American themes for a government project uh, in the history of this country. And I think the first WPA project, which Hilliard Robinson eventually got the um, Langston Terrace housing project that I talked to you about after these artists got this commission. I think that's one of the things that we, I think young people you hear WPA and it was the Work Progress Administration and for a lot of people were out of work. Architects were out of work, photographers, writers. And under the WPA, and you can search it now that everyone can go online. So people like Ralph Ellison, these great writers were writing for the WPA. Uh, George O'Keefe, uh, uh, Alfred Stiglitz were you know, photographing and painting and documenting under these programs. And it was the first time that government that was really sponsoring artists to look at the broader population. And you know, the Walker Evans great photography series, all those people were brought forward under the WPA program and actually talked about everyday people instead of just the leadership, again, because the leadership sort of under that time period had failed in a way that was beginning to look at the broader population. And so much of the art that we look at as 20th century art really came out of the, the, the momentum that was uh, kind of fostered under the WPA program. A lot of oral histories and things from that period. Greg? Awesome presentation, thank you. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> um, just wondering, I mean, the, pa the pavilion is like a museum. I mean, um, it really takes on that quality. And I'm just wondering, are there narratives or is anything in writing along the way that describes what has happened there? Well, I what? think they're building, the, the website has some information. The hospital pretend, uh, plans to have a broad level of programming, like he was talking about all these programming issues. So I think as time passes, I think, I don't know what the resources are, you can probably talk to that, but there's a program to look at this as being a real attraction in terms of coming to the community and interpreting the history of these uh, murals, which are significant, they're beautiful images. Yeah, well, in our, um proposal, design proposal, there was a lot of text written information as a part of the wayfinding uh, package for the hospital. But when 2009 happened and the markets went tanked, went south, um, a lot of the um, interiors and a lot of the finishes and a lot of the cultural stuff was put on hold, right? But, but we hope that's exactly what that is. It's, they're just on hold. So there are going to be plaques on the floor. There are going to be um, signs that are going to talk about all the way through the gallery as well as the atrium, um, what the designers' were intent was, um, what the murals were all about, what they represent, and some information on the artists as well. So we're hoping that at some point, and again, we have to find funding for that. It has to be a private entity. Uh, that that happens. I and mean, even organizing for this talk, I was reaching out to the hospital to try to see the schedule, and they're just trying to get a schedule together in terms of when they're you know, going to be accessible for people to come look. So hopefully we can, even on our site, can post some times in the future when, you know, they might be open. Yeah, there's a question over here? Yeah. Um, Jack, yeah, good afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you do some very fine work. Um, I remember you from the uh, Nicoba days at the um, Holland State Office Building, we're trying to get work with the School Construction Authority. Um, I'm a resident architect also. Um, this, this mural, so this mural is yours and Bernadette's design, or is an existing mural that you guys uh, made into this uh, front, uh, front but, wall? Well, this is your little snapshots from the much bigger mural project that he showed you. It was a card of several panels that tell different stories. And they pulled out details from that mural. So the, the gentleman here 
he was um, like a conductor, like say a Duke Ellington. And there was a jitterbug dancer in the corner. And that was from a segment that looked at uh, religious and entertainment music that was part of the mural. And then the middle one was uh, kind of arriving in the city and the jobs that were available to African Americans in the city. So you see a nurse, a secretary, an engineer with an M. I always think that was a Morehouse, <laughs> or Morehouse College. And so it could start to show that what the city offered in terms of black opportunity. And then the one at the far end here was at the end of the hallway, and it was the transition from the rural life to city life. It's kind of hard to read the details there, but you see some classic things like the broken wheel, which has been used in sort of allegory painting historically, and so moving from that system to the urban system. So this is like three snapshots out of what were seven panels in the original building. Right. We, we, there were four artists that we took information uh, from and put into the gallery. <clears throat> And we looked at Mr. Krimi's work and there were no black people in the imagery. We looked at Miss Seabrook's work and her work was very, very torn and, and damaged, right? So that left Mr. Alston's pieces and Virtus Hayes's pieces. Then when we looked at the fervor that Mr. Hayes had and wanting to tell our entire story, we thought that that's the one that should actually go on the, the building, right? So they are actual panels from Virtus Hayes's installation that we photographed, and then we fritted, and then we placed on the panels, and then we um, um, sort of photoshopped, <laughs> for lack of a better word, some of the imagery on it, because with the um, maestro, there were three girls mm -hmm. dancing with their dresses up, way up, and we <laughs> thought that probably that's not the best image that we wanted to do, but again, in order to crop and to Photoshop, we had to go to the Art Commission and a number of other people to talk to his son and everybody else to get an approval to do that. But we wanted to have the original works on the face of the building, which is driving the entire design concept for the entire project. And now, now to the south, there's a proposal to cover those lower floors of the old That's hospital. Right. And would they be Virtus Hayes images as well? Would well, if you see there, what I think we did was we just married images for the presentation. We don't know. We need to okay, take the time to right, right, figure yeah. out what the next continuum would be. Because the, for, for Mr. Alston's pieces, which was about, which I thought was very provocative, magic and, and medicine and modern medicine, I would love to see those two sort of played in some sort of way on the other side of the building as well. That would be my choice, but I'm Jack Travis. <laughs> and the second part of my question, um, as a former Federal Commissioner of the Department of Buildings, your facade, did they give you a hard time with your facade uh, <laughs> on your plans in terms of uh, being the energy code and fire ratings? We didn't get a hard time from, from anyone. Um, I think HOK did their homework, um, and I think that uh, David Balick and his way of approach, how he's going to make these panels, how those panels were actually going to be detailed and placed on the side. All that work was done. And because of the controversy, to be honest with you, two things. The controversy that happened in the 30s, and the fact that the community board had saw this project when we won the commission and wanted exactly that. They also wanted people in the, in the community to work on the project, but you know, that didn't happen as much as we'd like. Um, it, was, it was an easier time to go through the channels because there was so much backing. And, and to be quite honest, Harlem Hospital um, was amazingly supportive all the way through. Um, and so was New York Health and Hospitals. I can't even tell you. DASNY, I didn't know anybody uh, at the top from DASNY, but we got, again, no negative um, energy from anybody. It was, it was one of those projects that is just sublime. Sometimes that does happen, but, yeah. is, but, you, almost, but you, need a, you need a core that's that strong to be able to carry you through the bureaucracy, and, and certain things have this essence that speaks to everybody, that helps you ride all those other waves. I think it really makes a difference, and I think there was a powerful history to this, and there was so much unknown to the community, so just even bringing it out as a story brought a level of support in terms of what people thought and wanted to see. Right, the, the only problem on this project, money. That's really the only project problem. Um, down at 59th Street, Columbus is something like 65 feet high, right? They even built the living room. Did anybody but go yeah, to, I that? Went to that? They was went there, to the right? living room, to, right? That project was finished in less than three and a half years, right? Why? Because the Italian community came out and others 
and they donated privately, and that thing got done. Frederick Douglass took, what, 12 years? Well, yeah, partly because Jack wanted him on a column just like Frederick, like the Well, that's a whole other story, but I want to talk about that. <laughs> but that took 12 years because, again, it's government funded uh, for, for the most part, and people in our community still are, we have money, but we're reluctant in some ways in order to give that money, and we don't have that kind of free well, giving the, that you would find in other communities. No, to that, I was involved in that project, and we actually got the federal money to do that, but it became such a big project, and it's up to the contractor in the end to phase the project, and he was making so much money. It was during the boom period of uh, Harlem, buildings like this building being built, and once the city lets a contract for the street, Everybody that wants to build on that street has to deal with that contractor for Con Edison service, for the sidewalk, for everything. And it was so profitable for that contractor to have the broader contract of the uh, meat and potatoes of what he always does, sidewalk work and all of that, that he made the, the circle the last thing that he did. And so it went up Morningside, not Morningside, whatever the street, I think it's Morningside and all that. So he just put it off. And so the stone came from China, that took forever, all these other kind of things because that wasn't his expertise that little level of detailing so that's that's always the, I don't see that happening the, at 59th Street that's all well, I'm well, no, well, <laughs> well there's sidewalks though if you look at 110th Street from Fifth Avenue to Frederick Douglass Circle there's no side of Central Park that looks like that and we were able to get federal money to do that because we were seen as an underserved community and th they'll be hard pressed on every other side to ever get federal money to upgrade Fifth Avenue or Central Park West because people will say those people can afford it and those people will never say why should we pay for a sidewalk so I challenge you well, when you walk across 110th Street it's the nicest both sides we got funding for both sides of the street it's the highest level of improvement to Central Park on the sidewalk side of any side of the park. Yeah, this gentleman has a question. Hi, I uh, really enjoyed your presentation and, and I learned a lot, thank you. Um, I had a, a quick technical question. I noticed in one of the slides you had the windows animating and I wondered if that was showing the lamination process or, or whether, the, whether the windows themselves move. No, the windows are fixed, that's a very good point. It was just showing the lamination process, right? And it wasn't even as uh, technically detailed as it needed to be because there are actually three panes of glass. So there's a cavity wall and then there is a, a design wall, right? So that, that middle piece of glass is your insulation um, um, piece, right? And, and most um, dual panes stop with that. The third piece is where the artwork is and it's married to that p particular piece of glass, which I believe did not fit the uh, criteria for an insulative sandwich. So that's why we had to have three pieces of glass. Very good, was another, good point. Yes. You said, that, oh. uh, you said that Hilliard Robinson was an early inspiration for the facade work. At what point in the design process did the idea of taking the murals just from a restoration and preservation gallery piece to the facade take place? How early on was that? Well, I saw um, Langston Terrace housing <clears throat> in the 90s, right? And so I realized that Hilliard Robinson had actually gone to Germany and had studied Bauhaus design and went to DeSalle to uh, the, the campus, which, and he did this after he was going to work on this project. So knowing all of that and then visiting some of the residents in the place, I, I, I went to uh, Washington DC to visit a friend of mine at Howard University, and then I went by myself over to Langston Terrace Housing. I got off a bus, I walked through the streets, and I saw people looking at me through the, through the windows. And um, one woman comes out and she says, may I help you? And I said, no, thank you, I, I'm fine. You know, I was taking photographs. Another woman says, um, can we help you? And I said, I'm an architect, I'm just here looking at this project. And she goes, do you know who designed it? This is a woman who's living in the projects. And I said, no, she said, Mr. Robinson designed this. And I said, yes, I do know who designed this. And she says, do you want me to tell you about this? Five different families walked the streets with me from our projects and talked to me about this particular building and about the fact that the playground area was centered and that um, they can watch all of the children play from the waking spaces, you know, the kitchen, the dining room, the living room, and then the bedrooms are on the outside on the streetscape, so if anything happens late at night, people can get up right away and go to the, to the window, right? There's only a few entrances, and each entrance has only a few small number of apartments, 
and so that you should know who's coming in your building and out so you can control it. And where the children play, there's only two entrances, one on this side and one on that side. So no drugs, no prostitutes, none of that stuff can actually happen without a whole number, of, bunch of eyes looking in. And so I was just amazed. And I was amazed also that it had an eight-year waiting list when I went to see it. It was approaching its uh, 50th anniversary, 1988. In 1988, it got it, actually. And so I was just taken away. So when I saw this project, to answer your question, uh, it was from the beginning. I said, let's put black people six stories high because I found out about Virtus Hayes and what he was trying to do and I remembered immediately Hilliard Robinson and then when I found out that they both were doing this work under WPA I found out that Virtus was first um, in the commission and I don't know if those two ever got together but boy they really should have so from the very beginning it was my sense thank you yeah. thank you we have one hi Gwen Hi, oh, how are you? <laughs> sorry, that little snoo. I have a comment and a question. I'm sorry, I apologize, I didn't see the presentation from the very beginning, so if it's redundant. Um, I noticed in your presentation you had um, Augusta Savage mentioned. Now, Augusta Savage was such a very prolific artist from that time period. And she taught so many of those artists like J Jacob Lawrence and Charles White. And she's very instrumental in the Harlem art scene. Did she do any murals there oh, at, on I had that one site? I don't think so. No. But I had one, one of the team of artists was Morgan, um, you know, Morgan and Marvin Smith, the photographers. Mm -hmm. and all, um, um, yeah, Morgan Smith worked on this project, and they said they were directed to it by her. Okay. And so uh, apparently yeah. she might have been on another WPA project or whatever, but she was always seen as like the gatekeeper for she a lot was. of the artists. And I think she knew about the project and directed a lot of them to do like apprentice work mm -hmm. and stuff under this project because she knew it had money yes. associated with it. They would have some income. Right. Well, the, the reason she was mentioned briefly, as you said, is because that she and Alston actually worked together in a... Uh, a group, a studio call, I think 406, yeah, yeah. right? That's and the so, photograph you have as Yeah, that's right. And so that was the collaboration. So, yes, yeah, she knew about the project, but you bring up an interesting question because there was only one woman on this team. Why wasn't she chosen to be on the Harlem Hospital team? Why couldn't they, if she really wanted to do it, why couldn't they make it so that she could do it? Because they, they actually got it done over the head of the hospital. So the, all that politics is lost. We, at least we don't know. But now, what year was the mural? Were the murals done? Were they thirty-nine? Were they around in the thirties? Yeah, because um, uh, who were we just? I guess the Savage had a huge project for the New York World's Fair, which right. is thirty. Nineteen thirty-nine. Thirty-nine. This harp, like mm -hmm. figure. So she might have been had that big commission and been really focused on that commission, but had her ear to the other opportunities under the WPA, and so she didn't need these other, you know, this other commission really kind of maybe made a way for the others. That's all right. speculation, but yeah, that's true. possibly. Interesting. But you are going to, you, you said you're going to do something on another side? Well, yeah, you? the south side. South Is side. Um, yes, when we, we actually had uh, two um, um, phases for this project, and the second phase was to renovate the tower, right? But again, 2009, it crashed and everything sort of subsided. But we had 100 and, in the beginning, we had $109 million dollars to build the new patient pavilion, and I think $75 million to renovate the tower. And one of the reasons they wanted to renovate the tower is because um, of this need for private rooms in order to get government funding. If you, if you had wards and you had a lot of two-person rooms, um, and it was a certain percentage of your, your rooms, then you weren't able to get certain funding. So, uh, but that's on hold. In fact, there's a lot of things on hold, <laughs> right? Because we did a full package. And we, we're, we're seeing Ms. Seabrook's work being done, and we're seeing a lot of things happening very slowly. But there's a lot that, in terms of finishes, in terms of cultural dynamic, that's going to happen, hopefully, and continue. And I just want to say, uh, before you leave, you should come up and see this image on here, because that's not doing it any justice. Well, no, you should, you should take the subway. You can take the subway right out here at 110th Street and go up at 135th Street, and it's right there. And well, I just want to help you want to do that, because this is glorious, what I'm looking at here. It's longer. The proportions, and this guy, uh, Mr. Warcall's work is mm. to die for. We'll take one last question, and we're going to have to, we have one lady in the back here. I would have a question. Huh. Uh, I'm a Hollywood, but I think they told us that that maestro is Cab Calloway. I'm sure that's 
Well, he's, certainly he's styled in, in the Cab Calloway kind of dress, but you don't see the chorus girls. There's certain things in here that are so true to the culture that we don't talk about, but the, the, the jitterbugger and the orchestra leader were darker complected than the chorus girls are really fair, and so there, there's a little commentary there. There's a great image of the moving from uh, the south to the north that really shows a woman with braids. This was done in the 19... 30s, you know, before we start saying all that was kind of the end thing to do, and they just show a person in the field working and she's got the braided hair. So even as a document, cultural history document, it's a very interesting mural uh, to look at. And also, um, Mr. Alston's wife, I believe, was white. And there's not any mention of that except that there's one picture of her in one of his picture in his um, uh, dip, trip diptychs. Yeah, she was a nurse. Mm. And in modern medicine, there is a woman holding a baby who is white. And so he was really interested in looking at uh, equality as people are the same. And he wanted to show the doctors as the same. Um, and in that second mirror, modern medicine. And one of the reasons why he was so a charge was that he equality was the the focus. So with Mr. Alston and and Mr. Hayes, it was like Malcolm X and Martin yeah, Luther King. Yeah, yeah, fair. You really think about it, and that happens in Arkansas. It happens everywhere we are. We have, and we have if a you Martin see, Luther King and a, a Malcolm X. And also, if you look at the murals, there's some inaccuracies in in, in Africa. If you look at the headdress and everything, they look much sort of like Inca. Uh, Indians and stuff in terms of the headdressing and stuff is not really true. So you wonder if they were looking at National Geographic or something where they were drawing some of the images on the African side because they're not totally true right. to the kind of the dress and stuff of the of the period. But well, all, the, all which is yeah, just a quick comment. When people ask me, you know, what is the inspiration for what I do when I talk about African and Afrocentric, um, and the first thing that I I say to be honest, look, we don't know the history. Um, so what we do is we try to look at as much as we can, unearth as much as research as we can, and then in terms of design, I go with the feeling. Because as I said before, when I was young and I wanted to become an architect, I knew when I was 10 years old that I wanted to become an architect. Um, and then the first house I ever designed was a roundhouse. I don't know why I did it, but then one of the professors said, you know, that's an African, you know, you know, in Pluvium hut from, you know, West Africa. But I didn't even know any of this. And so I'm thinking like the woman who draws the chicken. Um, I'm going to draw chickens in my design. Well, on that note, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And in two weeks, we're going to have a, a photographer, uh, um, Albert Velbrecht, who lives here in Harlem, has documented a lot of Harlem architecture, but also documented architecture around the, the country. So we'll have a broader view of, of that. And it was interesting, I've talked to him a little bit in preparing for the next talk. And he came here from another country, and he lived in Harlem, went to City College, and he started to look at architecture. His window on American architecture was through Harlem architecture. And even in documenting things in his early period here, he's showing that Harlem before it changed. He was here right before a lot of the change. There's a lot of bridge in terms of images and stuff, so I encourage you to come back. Another so, fantastic photographer, because he also did my daughter's room. Oh, really? The New York Times article. Uh, well, now, we, we, uh, someone's going to be doing a dissertation on your daughter's room 20 years from now. Uh, th thanks a lot. Thank you.